Hi, everyone. That's for you. The clapping is for you, Kitty. Um, it's nice to see all of you again. Um, uh, and thanks for coming. We'll ju jump into this right away. But my, my one question about the Constitution from Mars is, I just assumed that Elon Musk would be the absolute dictator in any, in any and you're trying to like overthrow Elon Musk before he even gets there. Is that what I'm understanding? <laughs> no, we wanted the opposite of that, of course. The opposite, yes, of course. Um, so so um, uh, Ellen is, is one of the great young political theorists of the day. This is her new book from the end of last year, right? Open Democracy, and, and um, I have so many questions for you because um, you are proposing a series of things that sound um, simultaneously outlandish and also possibly necessary. So why don't you start by telling us what the problem is that you're trying to fix? And do it in like 12 seconds. Because <laughs> the people watching on the internet are very impatient for long answers. OK, but thank you first, uh, everyone. Uh, Jeff, uh, Kitty Boone, for inviting me. I'm really delighted to be here. So but, well, I was just thanking you all. <laughs> Oh, it fell. That's why. <laughs> that We're trying explain. to silence her already. Her ideas are too dangerous. Sorry, it's just right here. Can you hear me now? And this is themed because his name is Yale, and she teaches at Yale. By the way, this is very interesting. Does it does it hold? It's harmonic convergence. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes, yes. wonderful, thank you. So I, I wanted to thank uh, uh, the Aspen Festival, Jeff and Kili Boone for, for inviting me. So the problem I'm trying to solve is um, the crisis of representation we find ourselves in. Um, democracy is, uh, is in bad shape all around the world. People don't feel that uh, their governments stand for them, um, act for them, represent them in any meaningful sense. And so um, my question is, why is that? And uh, what can we do about it? And one of the diagnostic, which probably will come as a surprise to you perhaps, is that elections are to blame for much of the problem because the way we select our representatives ends up putting in power a group of uh, highly unrepresentative people from very homogeneous socioeconomic classes that um, you know, not only may not always work for, for the, the vast majority of people, but may actually not even um, see the problem because they have cognitive blind spots they uh, are not able to visualize, understand, conceptualize, identify the problems that ordinary people um, experience, and therefore they can bring the right solution to them. So the solution is then to rethink democracy and the way we select our representatives. But, but you talk about and stipulating that I'm not a defender of Congress as a high-functioning, highly intelligent body right now, but, but you talk about the people who come to, let's talk about just the American context. You talk about the people who come to Congress to be our, we, we vote to be our representatives as wholly unlike us, but, and it is true, it is whiter than average, there are more lawyers than average, um, and so on. But, but these are not aliens. These are people from their communities. Is it, is it something that happens in Washington where they change, or is the whole system broken right from the selection process? I've come to think the, the, the process is broken from the beginning, that, that elections are based on a distinction principle, and I'm not the one who you know, said it first. It's uh, from Aristotle to Montesquieu, who so more contemporary theorists, they all say that elections are in fact an oligarchic selection principle. So yes, they, they are like us in some ways, I mean more like us than or actually ordinary citizens, I guess, but they also um, you know, are overly educated, urban, uh, uh, you know, wealthy, uh, white, male. After a point, they, they, they sort of, this creates also a phenomenon of groupthink as well, where they get disconnected from the real problems of of uh, you know, vast majorities of people, and that's, that's a problem. I'm not saying that this is a bad system, especially compared to more authoritarian regimes, but it, it has a lot of flaws, and I think we've, we are now in the midst of realizing what those are. I don't want to overly simplify or have you overly simplify some complicated ideas that you write about, but talk about, talk about the insight that you derived from looking at the jury system in America. So the jury system, it's an old democratic institution where you um, uh, get a chance to exercise your judgment about uh, you know, uh, 
something very important, which, which is you know, uh, ma making a verdict about uh, the life or, or the prospects of another person. It's also a right that uh, Americans fought for and that they got to be uh, inscribed in the Bill of Rights uh, that I think was at the heart of the democratic ideal, the right to be judged by your peers, not by uh, an aristocratic superior or a notable. So I think it's quite essential to the democratic ethos. And Tocqueville, who visited America in 1835, that, that's one of the first things he noticed, how important the jury was to American institutions and to American um, uh, civil life, that it, it educated people. It created a sense of uh, community, a responsibility, uh, you know, and, and it, it, it fed the system and, and uh, right. reinforced the democracy. So what is the insight that you took from that that you are applying to a broader question? Well, the one insight is that we have a right to a say about certain collective uh, decision-making, you know, uh, decision, uh, decisions. And the other is that we should respect the common sense of ordinary citizens. If they are capable of making momentous decisions like that, uh, you know, in judicial matters, why not on, on political matters? Um, and, and it's not just the American jury. You can go back to the ancient Greek practice of uh, staffing political office by lot. In fact, they didn't know uh, elections. Elections were an oligarchic mechanism in their eyes. They only used it to staff um, uh, office, uh, offices like uh, administrative positions or, or uh, to choose generals. But when it came to lawmakers, they were chosen by lot. So that's what you want. Talk about, the, talk about the ideal system. And by the way, this is, and I want to get to this, but your ideal system would totally freak out James Madison. Absolutely. And anybody who had any hand in the federal, writing the Federalist yes. Papers. But, but, but descri describe the system that you would like to see and so, where Congress fits into this, but talk right. about the system. Okay, so I'll give you the, the, the more outlandish vision. I think it can be sort of, uh, you know, um, uh, presented in more hybrid, hybrid uh, versions, but the, the purest ver version of it would be a parliament made up of about 500 randomly selected citizens uh, who will be rotated uh, every two or three years and whose um, goal would be to set the agenda for the larger polity and to potentially make laws or delegate the lawmaking uh, function to another um, randomly selected assembly. Right. And, and th all of that would be connected to the larger public through moments of mass referenda and the possibility for every citizen in the country to um, you know, start a process called an initiative whereby if you gather enough signatures ar around an issue, you can put it to the agenda of the legislative assembly or even put it straight to a referendum. Right. And like I said, one of the reasons this is an idea, at least in political theory circles in New Haven, is taking hold, um, is, that, is that our Congress, our system right now, looks so dysfunctional. But how do you account for the fact that um, in this age of disinformation, an age when social media is doing so much lightning fast distortion of people's understanding of reality, how can you how can you have more faith in 500 randomly selected citizens to, to come gather in, I assume not Washington, that would probably be the point, um, and, and, and decide the overall agenda of the United States? We know very well now that some large percentage of American people believe that there are secret pedophile tunnels under the capital of the United States. So, so let's assume that only 20% of the people chosen randomly by lottery believe that. How is that better than Congress? Right, no, very, very good point. Um, so there are some... There are no pedophile tunnels under the Capitol, by the way. Right. I just want to stipulate that. So I, I base my, my trust in uh, ordinary citizens first on, on um, uh, you know, empirical evidence. We have a lot of evidence about the way juries function and function well. Uh, we have evidence from ancient Greece that a non-electoral democracy functioned relatively well for a certain period of time. They sure, didn't have was, Twitter in they, Greece. That is true, um, but in some ways they, they were, had to overcome more, uh, you know, difficulties to communicate. So, I, I mean, you know, on, on balance, I'm not sure. And I also uh, rely on uh, theoretical evidence more uh, than perhaps the founders had at their disposal, actually, to understand the logic of collective deliberation and, in, and what I call collective wisdom. And that um, um, uh, theoretical uh, you know, set of arguments says that in order to have a smart assembly, you're better off with a diverse group of ordinary people, or at least you know, not, not necessarily uh, 
extremely smart people than with a group of PhDs, basically. And that's very counterintuitive because it, it means that you need to maximize the diversity of your group um, rather than you know, uh, the number of diplomas that each uh, uh, member has. And so if you put all of that together, it starts to, to look like a good case for a lotocratic system over an elected system, which is a lot more homogeneous and a lot more biased. Right. right? Um, so now you're asking the question about uh, information, disinformation, um, filter bubbles, and all that. Well, that's, that's definitely uh, a problem. It's a problem for an elected system and a lotocratic system. I just think that uh, in a diverse body, you're more likely to debias than in a highly polarized or too homogeneous body. So the solution is more deliberation um, so that you kind of filter out the bad arguments, the bad information, and mm -hmm. get closer to the truth. That, that, that said, even in my system, you'd need to have reliable information and reliable media and, and, um, and good sources of information. But that, that's where I also think the, the causal arrow goes the other way as well. It's not just that you need, uh, as a precondition, good media to have good political decision making. You first need a real democracy to then you know, control and generate the right uh, informational environment. So what role do experts play in this? And I ask, I ask for a very specific reason, because you, you remind me only in one way of William F. Buckley, yes. um, which is that he famously said that he'd rather be ruled by the first 50 people in the Cambridge phone book than by the faculty of Harvard University. Um, <laughs> But, what, and you're arguing against interest here as a tenured member of the Yale faculty, but what, what are the role of experts play uh, in this future democratic ideal state? So I have to say, I'm on the, the Senate of my university and I can confirm that Buckley is right. <laughs> <laughs> So what do we expect? Noting that she has tenure, so she <laughs> Yes, that's only, I can only say that now. Um, so, and experts are essential to any regime. I'm not a populist in the sense of like, we should you know, cut off the heads of every knowable person. No, of course not. You, you need a bureaucracy, you need um, experts to uh, be, as you always say, on tap and not on top, meaning at the service and disposal of, of, of citizens, not in a position of controlling and telling them what to do. And it's perfectly doable. Um, you know, in, in the, 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 experience, the experiments of citizens' assembly that I talk about in the book, including the French recent case of a citizens' convention for climate, you had 150 randomly selected citizens and about as many experts present to help them educate themselves about climate change about ways to curb greenhouse gas emissions. And over the course of nine months, they educated themselves through, with the help of those experts about all the solutions that exist, and they came up with 149 proposals of great quality. In fact, they were quasi-legislative proposals. Um, so I think this can be done, and you don't have to sacrifice so knowledge and expertise. I just want to push a little bit more on your optimism, right? I mean, stipulating that we, we all live in a world that James Madison created, right? And, and his mentor, George Washington, more than Jefferson's yes. world. Madison was a pessimist about human nature. Jefferson was more of an, an optimist. I'm, uh, and, and Madison believed, among other things, uh, that, that it would be tragic situation, well, factions would be tragic, obviously factions, the 18th century term for political parties in some ways, um, that that would be tragic and that it would be tragic if the President of the United States was in direct communication with the American people. He, he actually was worried that the, the rise of daily newspapers was gonna to create too frenetic a pace of information and distortion um, for the American people to handle, right? Um, so, 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 so he designed a system that, that we live in today. Um, it's worked fairly well. Um, where does your optimism, where does your more than Jeffersonian optimism come from about human nature and the ability of large groups of very disparate kind of Americans coming together and making rational decisions about the common interest? So there's a question about um, um, Madison uh, pessimism. I mean, in so, on some level, he, he himself uh, based it on his experience with, with you know, human nature and, and his knowledge of history, but the truth is that he didn't have that much empirical evidence for the system he designed. It was a lot of theory, a lot of history, but very little social scientific evidence at the time. So we're in a better position today, I think, in some respects, to come up with a better system. Um, 
And then it's true, uh, you, you, have, you, you call it my optimism. I, I think it's also um, a fundamental democratic trust in my fellow citizens, which I don't think Madison necessarily had. Um, and so when we trust in a jury, uh, when we trust in the principle of one person, one vote, is it a form of optimism or is it just a recognition of a fundamental principle of equality? I think it's different to cast it as optimism as opposed to a democratic principle. Because if you say optimism, then you sound naive. You sound like, you know, you're taking a risk. And what about, you know, minority oppression and all these things? And so let's counter majoritarian wills and, and uh, will and, 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 you know, increase the anti-democratic aspect of our system because, because liberalism, because we need to be really careful. And, but is it really realism or is it demophobia? I think meaning fear of the people. And I think Madison had, had a form of demophobia. He feared the masses. He was pretty frank about that. Oh yeah, 63, yeah. Article 63, he says in, in, the, in the Federalist Papers, uh, you know, it's a good thing that the American system is designed to basically, um, uh, you know, uh, prevent any form of uh, mass participation. Right. I want you to step back a little bit more and, and go a little deeper in the diagnosis or, or the history of how we, got, how we got to a place that is so bad that you think that this radical, my word is outlandish, not, not yours, mm -hmm. but outlandish idea is more plausible or more effective than the system that we have. What are the, what are the, the triggering events for you in the course of you could expand this to France if you want as well, but, but uh, in, in, in the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years of American history that have led to um, a representative democracy that you believe is neither representative nor democratic? I think, I, I, interestingly, I would trace it to my, my, my arrival in the US, 2001, the fall of the Twin Towers. I felt like this was a huge crisis for democracy already, a, sort, a sense that, you know, why do they hate us? Why is this system not loved anymore or something like that? Then 2008, financial crisis. Why is this not working? Uh, and also the, 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 the way um, our, you know, elected elites uh, solve, solve the problem. I mean, it, 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 we can debate what was feasible or not at the time, but it's not clear that it worked out in favor of, um, you know, everyone. Then 2016, the populist backlash against years of neoliberalism. Uh, in, in the UK with Brexit, in, in the US with Trump, perhaps a little less in France at the time. And now 2021, an enormous pandemic, a global pandemic, uh, which very few regimes have been able to actually you know, prepare for. And so I think we're at a moment where our self-doubt is enormous and we're finally willing to face up, face up to the fact that our system is flawed, fundamentally flawed. And Yes, these ideas are outlandish, I, I, I know that, and, but I think they are less so than even 10 years ago. 10 years ago, we wouldn't have been talking about this at all. Can you, you mentioned your arrival in America um, 20 years ago. Um, you have a very, very interesting story of being raised in a country with a very centralized, powerful federal system. Um, talk a little bit about, about what the French state, I'm boiling this down to make it simpler, but what the French state wanted from you and how your, your arrival in America and the work you're doing now is kind of a, a rejection of what the French state wanted for you. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm indeed the pure product of this uh, French Republican system where you, know, you, you get a free education and, and you're um, I, I, you know, my parents were um, teachers, and so I, I, I sort of was uh, plucked from, you know, a pool of good students to be in this uh, elite school called the Ecole Normale Supérieure. And there, I just you're not from, from Paris. No, you're... I'm from Normandy, like Tocqueville. <laughs> and, like Tocqueville. And I, I, I felt like I'd, I was drinking the Kool-Aid a bit for a while. I, I, I was reading Plato, and I was you know, in agreement, yes, philosophers should rule. I was a philosopher, so why not, you know? And, and the, the, it's true that the, the, in these schools they tell you, you're the elite of the nation, you're going to be in positions of power, and so you have a responsibility, and but they, so, you know, it's, it's flattering and, and... And unlike and in America, they don't feel bad about saying that, frankly, right? Oh, at Yale, they don't feel bad about saying it either. Yeah, oh, really? Oh, no. 
No. Because at Harvard, thing. there's like a little bit of guilt around the fact that they're the ruling elite. Really? I, I also went to Harvard. I didn't notice that. <laughs> yeah, it's a little so, bit more at Harvard. <laughs> so anyway, so... But, but it's true. They tell you you have a responsibility, but you're also, you know, inculcated with a sense of, like, uh, privilege and, and, and that you are expected to be in positions of, of power. And then I came to America and... and all of that crumbled for me. I, I, um, I remember arriving in Boston and, and taking the taxi, and this conversation with the taxi driver was in 2001, so prior to the economic crisis and even just prior to the Twin Towers. Um, and, and this guy was just really proud and talking to me, completely unimpressed by my credentials. And uh, it was just a really normal conversation, you know, on a completely level playing field. That's how it felt to me, which I had an experience in France because the the relationship between different, um, you know, uh, groups are a lot more fraught. Uh, it's probably even more true in, in Great Britain, for example, but um, the kind of accent you have, the kind of position you hold, whether you're a cleaning lady or a professor, or it, it just um, materializes in the interactions. And I felt like in the US it wasn't like that at all, that you could be a billionaire or a cleaning lady and, and engage in a, in a conversation on, a, on an equal uh, level. And I think that's what's so fascinating about this country and what gives me hope in a way, and that, that's also what was so inspiring to Tocqueville. It's this fundamental equality of conditions that he, that, that came with the foundation of the country. I mean, the, the you know, the, the sort of like a moment of equality at the beginning. I mean, not for, for everyone and, and certainly that, you know, if you consider the, the, the natives and the, the black population. Of course, not everyone was equal, but there was a moment of social equality at the, at the, at the beginning, and, and it still transpires in everyday interaction to this day, I think, despite massive in economic inequalities, despite you know, power imbalances and all sorts right. of things. Talk, talk about this a little bit more. We're gonna go to questions in a, in a couple of minutes, by the way, uh, both uh, for the live audience and for people who are watching on the web. Um, but, but talk a little bit more well, let's stay on the Tocqueville theme, since if you play your cards right, you're the next Tocqueville. Um, <laughs> the, uh, uh, 200 years ago, he noticed certain small d democratic qualities of the, of, of, um, of the way Americans interact with each other. You've been alluding to this a little bit. Do you think that, uh, that, that these qualities, that I think you're, you're, you're resting a lot of hope in the perpetuation of these qualities. Um, do you think that um, these are not under almost kind of existential pressure right now? I think they are. Um, what are the sources of that pressure? But I think when you reach too high a level of e economic inequality, then people stop interacting. It's that simple. You know, uh, when you never see your cleaning lady when you only fly private jets, when you just don't understand the problems of ordinary people, then it becomes harder to maintain this social um, equality. I think that's what's under threat. And, and also, if uh, the, the bottom falls out and you have people who live in dire poverty and have all these you know, um, psychiatric problems, and I mean, you, you can't either relate on a, on a you know, uh, as equal with, with, with them, and they can't relate to you. So I think there needs to be, I think there needs to be a, a compression again of all those, those massive economic inequalities. Two more questions. One is very specific about your core idea, one of your core ideas, and the other is comparative. Um, the question about the core idea, it's, it's, it sounds great in principle, and, and it is, it is a kind of exciting cognitive leap to realize that we already do this in the jury system. We gather random citizens to judge very important matters, life and death matters, um, and it kind of works. Um, so it's, it's feasible to imagine um, non-professional, Cincinnatus kind of uh, non-professional politicians, people, people deputized to temporarily make decisions on behalf of their, of their fellow citizens. But how do, how do you get a, a, an embedded system to agree to that? I mean, you, can't, you have to go to Congress and say, hey, what we'd like you to do, because you people are corrupt and myopic, we would like you to cede power back to the people, and then they say, but we do represent the people, and then the people say, no, actually, you don't. How do you get from here to there where this is, where this is even a feasible 
thing to design. So, so the, the question from here to there, if this is the hardest one. Um, so first, this is why you're a political theorist. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Ideal theory is so much easier, right? But so, so first of all, notice I'm not saying they're corrupt. I, I'm really focused on the epistemic dimension, the knowledge-related question, the fact that they have blind spots. And so if you, if you look at the problem that way and you don't start you know, uh, hurling insults at them, I think they can come to agree that it's true. It's more fun to hurl insults. I know, but it doesn't, <laughs> doesn't solve the problem. And, and I think a lot of people that are currently elected agree, actually. They think, well, yes, we, 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 we can't connect anymore. We, we're elected sometimes with less than 10% of the population. I mean, what kind of legitimacy do we have? Who, do we, who can we claim to represent? So they want help. And so this model I'm proposing, you could also use in a hybrid way as a way to augment electoral institutions, to give them more wisdom, to help them become more representative again. And so in France, again, it's, it's a good example of um, something that, that has been tried and has not been completely successful, but they, this French Citizens Convention for Climate was meant to help the government um, make climate change you know, uh, policies in a way that would be legitimate and, and backed up by the population. In, in Ireland, the same thing happened with the a, with a Citizens' uh, Assembly on, on uh, the decriminalis decriminalization of abortion. Parliament was behind that, that uh, assembly because they needed help transform the, you know, the country. On those you, you've spoken about the guns issue in America mm -hmm. as an issue that can be unlocked by, by gathering random selection of a large number of randomly selected citizens. Talk about how it would work in the specific example of a, of a question that everybody knows is a problem, but no one can sort of figure so out. That I have to say, it, it's a mystery to me that uh, gun regulations cannot be passed in this country. And there are majorities behind the idea, but somehow Congress can do it because the lobbyists uh, are just too powerful. So that, that's another problem that has to do with the role of money in politics in electoral systems. It's, that, that actually leads to corruption in that case. If you had a, a jury, a uh, large jury, like 300 uh, randomly selected Americans deliberating for several months uh, on the weekends, paid, uh, about how, what to do, I think they'd come up with solutions that'd be completely reasonable, acceptable by the larger population, and that Congress should commit to implementing with very little tweaks, you know? Uh, and, and the idea would be that uh, the, the NRA would, would be allowed to speak and be heard, but it couldn't buy votes and couldn't sort of influence and interfere the way I think it's currently. And the very nature of a lottery system means that after you finish your service, you just go home to your regular yeah, job, so and there's really no reason the NRA would, would have any influence over you or any other lobbying organization. If you're here as a citizen, you don't owe anything to anyone. You know, you, you don't have to fall in line. You don't have to. It's just uh, you and your conscience in some ways. Um, before we go to one last question, before we take questions, um, talk about the Iceland example because these these ideas have been applied. You talk about the French example on climate change. Talk about Iceland a little bit. So Iceland is a very tiny country, 320,000 people, but it's been incredibly inspirational for me because in 2008, when their financial and economic system collapsed, you know, they burned seven times their GDP, they decided that it was time to change things radically. And so in 2010, they uh, conducted a very participatory constitutional process whereby they said, you know, we want a new constitution. We want a new social contract. And we will start with a national forum of 950 randomly selected Icelanders who are going to tell us what values and principles they want to see encoded in the foundational text of this country. And so those 950 deliberated for a day and they said things like, well, we want to protect the environment. We want to uh, you know, um, be a, a more social and, and, and uh, you know, um, generous society, etc. So they had all kinds of ideas. And then a group of 25 elected ordinary citizens, because politicians had been deemed too corrupt to participate in the elections, were in charge of drafting the, the text. And they thought, well, we can't do that on our own. It's only 25 of us. So we're going to put our drafts online for everyone to see. We're going to take into account the feedback of the crowd and the larger public. So they did that. That was an iterated process. After four months, they came up with a very good proposal. And that proposal was put to a referendum uh, in the fall 2012 and two-thirds of the voting population approved it. That looked to me like quite an ideal way of writing your social contract. Didn't work in the end because Parliament um, refused to vote and, and turn this text into law. 
But still, if you look at the design and, and the intentions and the way it worked out, I think this is very inspirational. Um, I know that there's mics or a couple, one or two mics. So just raise your hand, and um, I have a hard time seeing. But there's a question over here, and then maybe over here next. Uh, hi. Um, I'm going to try to think of a very productive way to ask this question. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to return to a question uh, that you asked, Jeffrey, about, you know, why can't, what is the risk of doing this given that a large percentage of the country believes, let's call them extreme things? And I guess my question is, you frame that as a reason not to do it as opposed to a symptom of the current system where there's actually a very strong incentive for elites to keep people believing extreme things because those are some of the most reliable voters you can get. So, you know, and also to foster, you know, persistent racism or other things that produce reliable if distasteful voters. So I guess, uh, why am I wrong in saying that's a reason actually to change it instead of to keep it? No, 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 go ahead. No, it's for you, I think. What? It's for you, I think. No, no, it's for you. But I, I think I, I, I agree uh, with the gentleman. I think, uh, indeed, the fact that the, the system is not working is even, it's, it's a reason to try something new. I think there's a risk in not trying something new at this moment. What, 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 is the, what is the exact risk? Do you think that we're just on, do you think that we're on a well, you know, but the, the irreversible risk. slide? Yes, at this point, I mean, January 6th did not open up your eyes, I mean, there's no exceptionalism to America. I was actually there, it really opened my eyes. I mean, <laughs> how much farther down that slope do we really want to go? The, the, the legitimacy of institutions is that, is that an all time law. And, and I mean, look at the risks, I mean, France has taken it, Ireland has taken it, Iceland has taken it, uh, soon enough Australia will take it. Now there are cities all over the world who are trying that, and, and, and taking risks. Um, Paris wants to create a, a Parisian assembly selected at random. So I think there are enough experiments around the world to know that this is not the, you know, guaranteeing collapse. I mean, this, this, this actually, in fact, I'll tell you that, that from the opposite side of this conversation, I get attacked for being too, you know, conciliatory or, and, and that in a way, these assemblies are a way for the powers that be to buy social peace. They do what's called participatory washing. You create an assembly of randomly selected citizens, you let them deliberate for nine months, meanwhile, mass protests diminish, and at the end, you do nothing, right? Um, so it, it's not revolutionary at all. It's common sense. It's very practicable. It's not that costly. Elections cost a fortune uh, with very little you know, benefits in terms of public education because it's a lot of spin and a lot of propaganda. Uh, when you do a, a citizen's assembly, the, the costliest has probably been the French one because we do everything the grant way. So it cost 5 million euros, something like that. I mean, it's, it's not much. Mm -hmm. And democracy has a price, and we should be willing to pay for it. Let me, um, just before we go over there, I just want to uh, add a question that we got over the web from Jenny, who writes, I appreciate the need for good sources of information. How could we ensure a shared sense of what is fact? We struggle with that now. And I, and I, and I, and I would say that, that, that don't hear a ton from you about the distorting effects of filter bubbles and echo chambers and, and, and alternative fact sets, or however you want to frame it. So how, it seems like a prerequisite for a gathering of 500 randomly selected Americans to, to come into a room or whatever it is with a shared reality, some sense of shared reality. How do you, how do you build that as a prerequisite? So actually, it's not a prerequisite. When you, you bring those 500 uh, citizens together, you presuppose nothing. You take them as they are, with all their biases and their you know, lack of information, and you tell them, this is a process of learning, and we're going to learn together. And somehow, in the experiments I've observed at least, people come in with actually a certain amount of um, humility and, and willingness to learn. And because they're chosen not as a representative of the Republican Party or the Democratic Party or any group, and they are not sure who they're talking to because it's all at random, so you, you don't really know, you can't tell who thinks what. They're not tempted into this logic of 
tribalism, where you signal that you agree on things and then you, you, you avoid certain topics because you, you want to display your loyalty to a party. So this, this partisan mindset that we are so used to in electoral systems because that's how it functions, it's non-existent at, at the beginning at least in, in those assemblies. It tends to form again you know, through the process around other issues. And, but at least for, for you know, a certain amount of time, and you can, you, can, you can incentivize it and structure it, you get people who are willing to learn and, and de-bias themselves. And so you, I was talking about the French example, and we had a climate, climate change denier in the group. You know, and somehow he listened to the scientists, and after a while he was like, well, I'm still not a very pro-environmental uh, policy person, but I think we need to do something. You know? So you get a form of consensus that doesn't require you to align on every dimension, but it makes people converge on, on factual truth. Um, there was that question over there. Yes, thank you. Yes, if we, if we take a look at the system that we have now, I think we all look at this and say, this is broken. They can't get anything done and we look at the Senate and the House, and we watch these discussions, the average person just gets said, this, is, this, is, this just doesn't work. And now the question would be, theoretically, we, we, can read, we can read the Republic and say, well, Plato's got great ideas. These are terrific in an academic atmosphere. But how practically, when the control really is in the House and the Senate, they control their own destiny. How do we, how do we make this change? It's again the question from here to there. So I can only tell you what happened in other countries. It's a mix of uh, finding an advocate at the top and having social movements at the bottom to put pressure on the decision makers from both sides. So in France, this was made possible by uh, President Macron's willingness to try a citizens convention. But his willingness to try something like that was brought about by the social movements known as the Yellow Vests. If it were not for the Yellow Vests, you know, breaking stuff uh, and protesting vehemently for months, I, I don't think uh, the president would have tried that. In Ireland, it came from the parliament, I think, and um, people there talking to activists and academics. Academics played a huge role in Ireland in, in, uh, in pushing for this uh, citizens' assembly on, on, uh, on abortion and other things. Um, and Parliament was struggling because party members were not willing to take a public position on abortion. It was, too, it was a third rail of, of Irish politics, a very Catholic country, and so, so they thought, well, let's basically give the hot potato to a group of citizens, and then we can say, oh, we're doing what you guys want. Um, and, and, and that's what happened. In the US, I am not sure. I think there's not enough um, of a social movement in favor of these kind of reforms. It's not out there yet. Uh, maybe it will change. Maybe there will be a conversation around these things. I think change is more likely to come from first at the state level. And so I'm hoping that there will be some experiments there. And you know, it's not like you haven't experimented with um, randomly selected bodies yet. I mean. Uh, Jim Fishkin at, uh, at Stanford has been conducting so-called deliberative polls for years. Uh, Ned Crosby invented the concept of a, um, a jury, uh, you know, a consensus jury in, in the U.S. And, and it's been also done for years. So th there's a lot of empirical evidence. We, we just don't talk about them that much in the, in the media, and, and I don't think elected politicians are so interested yet, but I think they, they will have to become interested. Um, over here, there's a, right in the second row, yeah. Uh, when we started this discussion, it reminded me of the Swiss experiment. And uh, we've talked about Ireland and Switzerland and Iceland. All of these are small societies. And in our world, in the United States, we are a very complex society. And right now we find ourselves without a central organizing uh, position. And so my question to you is, how do you uh, propose to handle such a large group or a large society to establish a representative democracy? 
So that's a really, really key question, um, the diversity argument. And it's true that if you look at the more successful example of, of what I was talking about, Iceland, Ireland, uh, Switzerland is a different sort of case because it's a semi-direct federal democracy, but it's also quite successful, but it's small and, homo and somewhat homogeneous, meaning white and Christian. But France, actually, uh, is a sort of landmark in the... In, in these cases because it's a large country, it's 67 million people, and it's a very diverse country at this point. We are a multicultural nation. Um, you know, we have a large um, Arab Muslim population. Uh, we, we, so, so, and, and, you know, all kinds of populations were present on the, on the uh, climate change assembly. So it was on an issue that perhaps didn't raise certain questions around immigration and things like that. Climate change was more perhaps consensual. But I am quite convinced that you could have a successful assembly on mo almost any question. I don't think diversity is an issue. If anything, diversity is an argument a fortiori to have such assemblies. Because what is the alternative? Staying in our polarized environments and not talking to each other? No, we need to have conversation, hard conversations, face to face, online if need be, uh, across divides. So there's no alternative. I think. Um, there's a question here, and then we'll just do one more from here. In the old days, we used to introduce ourselves. My name is Elliot Levy. I'm from Miami. Do you think there is a possibility that the election day itself and the voting process is a problem between um, <clears throat> the strange day of the week that elections are held, these presidential elections are held, the lack of low turnout in certain communities, the failure of electronic systems to work, the archaic punching a hole in a paper. It seems to me, and the, and the constant demand for a re-vote, recall, that seems like there's a problem. Could you please comment on that? Um, yes, I think there's a problem in, in, in the things you, you describe. Um, but even if we fixed them, I think the larger problem would still be there. So, you know, the, the, the sort of fixes you're calling for, to me, they're, they're they're important, they're crucial in some ways, but they're also um, marginal. It's the same with money in politics. You can try to get money out of politics, but first of all, we're not succeeding, and there might be a, you know, an intrinsic reason why. And second, even if you take money out of politics, you're still stuck with this problem of lack of representation. You're not gonna be able to democratize elected assemblies elected assemblies as much as is needed to truly get a picture of what the country is and wants and needs. That's, so that's basically the, you know, the, the view I have of the problem. Um, there was a question that just sort of disappeared from my screen, but um, it basically said, uh, the, the question goes, what does success actually look like? And I wanna, if you actually got to this more representative situation, and let me add one question on top of it. What does the president do what does the executive branch do in a situation in which the course and direction of a country is decided by a rotating cast of quote unquote common citizens? Right, so first of all, success for me would be that at a minimum, when you ask people, are you satisfied with your representatives, at least 50% say yes. In this country, the answer has never been higher than 30%. I mean, how, how acceptable is that? Um, in Switzerland, you know, people are happy with their system. They're happy with their democracy. So I think that's a good threshold of legitimacy. Is a majority happy with what they get? Uh, and your second question was? Uh, what, does the, what does the president ah. in, this, in this vision do when the referenda are deciding the course of, of American politics or American policy making? So that's a really difficult question. I, I, uh, my, my sense is that the executive should execute and not legislate. But somehow in the US and in a lot of those presidential democracies, we've entrusted the president with legislative roles and goals and functions. And I don't think that's good because we're, it brings us closer to a monarchy than to a democracy. So my sense would be, should be that, is that the president should execute and have a much less of a role we should be in more parliamentary systems, actually. My final question for you, you've been here for 20 years. Um, are you more French or more American now? 
I'm, I'm, I'm applying for my American citizenship as, as we speak. <laughs> So I, I, I'm half, halfway, I, I just, I'm very Americanized at this point. When I come home, I'm, I don't, I'm, st I'm still very French, but I, I, I'm both. What, is it, what does that mean? When you go home to France, you feel Americanized. What, with the people around you, how are they reacting to your Americanization? What are they, what are they seeing? They're annoyed. <laughs> 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 oh, Helen, you're so American. I get that all the time. Um, no, no, but it, it's, these are very real issues. I, I just organized a conference at Yale uh, on citizen legislators, and my co-organizers were French, and we had very difficult conversations around inclusion and who to invite and what diversity looks like, and, um, and it's difficult. Uh, you know, in France, you, you can't track race, it's illegal. Uh, and it's not, it's not all bad. I think the idea of being colorblind actually in the ideal, is, is, is should be a good thing. It's just that I don't believe it works anymore. So that that have changed on a lot of issues. Right. Well, we wish you the best in your Tocquevillian journey. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for doing this. And thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Thank you. That was good.